Hey guys, welcome back to the Creative Cranium. It's great to be here on a Friday night, and I got some cool guests tonight. Please welcome my pals, Christy Shin and R.W. Nunley. Hello, how's, how's it going, going, guys? How you guys doing? It's good to see you. You too. Been good. Yeah, it's been uh, busy for me, running a bunch of stuff and getting a bunch of stuff done. Well, thanks so much for coming on the air, and I got some great questions for you guys. And as you know, um, in the comic creating space, the coolest kids are always the artists, and that's why I'm really looking forward to talk to you guys tonight. I'm going to start by launching right in. Um, I'll start with Christy. Mm -hmm. you know, Christy, I see you all over the place. I think you're doing a terrific job marketing your brand, but what I want to know is how did you get your start? Oh, just in art in general or in... Um in just this comic or just in comics in general? Um, you know, maybe, how about a little bit of both? Well, I mean, I've always drawn since I was a kid. Uh, there was no question of what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an artist or a creative of some sort. Hey guys, what's up? Uh, so there's that. And so I always drew, never wanted to give up drawing. And even though I would have do art, simultaneously I would have other jobs as well to get me to that place to be able to do art. I did freelancing plus like the corporate boring jobs, the crap jobs, you name it, in order to get my career going. I did make a couple of forays into comics. They were kind of laughable in the sense that I just drew my own. I'm like, oh, this sucks. But when I went ahead and I did, um, when I did, started doing Demon Bitch and all that and Personal Monsters, that's like about five or six years ago, Personal Monsters and then Demon Bitch. And then it just kind of skyrocketed from there. Like I actually got a Ringo Award in 2018 for Best in Wow. Politics. Congrats, yeah, Christy. I didn't even know that. You know, for a while, I kind of was really low key about it because like I just kind of didn't. It's kind of funny when I won it. It's like I just found out the day of and I'm like, oh, we were nominated. Holy shit. So like, there you go. I, I have a Ringo Award. And, wow. uh, and that's I awesome. Congrats, buddy. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really great. And um, yeah. And so Demon Bitch has been really hitting hitting it in the stratosphere right now. And I'm very, very pleased with that. Cause it's like my biting social commentary, which I really love doing. I love laughing like a little jerk when I draw it. And then I have another uh, comic series called Sepulchre and that's more serious. And uh, so demon bitch is about a low level demon from the 13th bit of hell where people throw their dog shit and gum wrappers. And she wants to bring the second coming of Armageddon, but the first one never happened cause she's a stupid piece of shit. So it's based off girls I hate. And then the other <laughs> one Sepulchre. Yeah. Sepulchre is about a woman whose husband tries to kill her to marry another woman but he fucks up and she doesn't die, but she goes to kill him, but she's lost her voice. So I'm working on volume two. And uh, I got to say that this con season and everything just sort of went surge straight ahead. So I had to put Sepulchre on hold and still do Demon Bitch. Nice. And, you know, it's I got to imagine for somebody at your level, it's a lot to juggle, right? I mean, it is what it is. Like I juggle a lot anyway. I mean, I'm also the president of Comic Art Professional Society and uh, we go and do that. So I've had fun with that. Yeah, I, I do swear a lot. <laughs> but apparently I've been told I've been very nice. So, uh, but yeah, so some of my friends have called me Demon Bitch. Like they say it as my nickname. So I come on as Demon Bitch and I guess that that helps. So the Comic Art Professional Society that was started in 1977, uh, that was from Mark Evanier, Don Rico and Sergio Aragones. Oh, wow. And we all know all those guys. Sure. And uh, I took over as president about two years ago, almost two years ago. And I, we basically help people that are in the sequential arts, letterers, artists, I mean, letterers, inkers, writers, and we also take writers. I, I said we're writers. Okay. Anchors, letters, pencilers, and writers. So we take that as well. And it's creatives. And we try to do a network where they can all interact with each other. We can find out about shows, find out ways to help each other. And I've been plugging us into resources like legal, and distribution and marketing. It, they're not obligated to take it, but it's there. And we just welcomed our first international member, El Cartoon, about a month or two ago from mm -hmm. May. And he is from Tijuana, from Baja, California, Tijuana, or Tijuana, Baja, California. Cool. That's yeah. awesome. And so, we will have and, at Comic Con as well. So, how many years? Well, I guess that probably was not polite to ask how long mm -hmm. you've been doing it. Yeah, I'll, I'll rephrase that question when I come back around. Okay, it's fine. Uh, so, uh, RW, or do you go by Randy or RW? Uh, either or. I've been putting RW on the books. So, okay. RW, Randy. I'm going to ask you the same question. So, and I've been following your work a little bit too. Of course, we're kind of just meeting for the first time, but it looks terrific, man. And I'd Thanks. like to ask you, how did you get your start? 
and also add in there if you had any professional training. Uh, well, I mean, I did go to uh, I did go to college for art, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, but my my dad he was an artist also, and uh, my uncle Brad was a real big guy in the local con scene. Oh, and okay. when I was a little kid, my dad, like, he was selling, like, pinup art and things like that out at the cons, and I got to tag along with him. And uh, every once in a while, I'd get a few bucks to spend in the dealer room. And that's, nice. that's kind of how I found my first comic book and, and got into that, so from a very early age. Can I ask you, what was, if you remember, what was your first comic? It was Wolverine number 24. Oh, sweet. Ooh. Who was the artist, R.W.? Uh, you know, I... I can't remember, but I can I can see it plain as day. He's standing on the trash can with, uh, I think it's uh, like making Madripoor, Singapore in the background with all the signs. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I will uh, I'm taking a quick look. Uh, the cover is, uh, let's see here. Right? Penciler Federico Vicente. Does that sound? Oh, no, that's the 2021. Yeah. I forgot there's like 32 relaunches of Wolverine. Yeah. So, um, Tell you what, let's change it up a little bit. So, Christy, I want to ask you this. You know, hey, obviously a super intelligent person. Why art? Like, out of all the things you could have picked, why did you gravitate toward making art? Um, you know, I think uh, it's just what I do. It's just, um, you know, sometimes you have – oh, thank you, Mr. Fish. But, Fish is yeah, the I, think, I love that, dude. Yeah, he, Fish is cool. But, uh, yeah, um, I think it's just like – it's just – I think there was this movie that Nick Nolte was in and it's like, you do art because you must. So it's like, that's just what I did. You know, I wasn't really happy and neither could I see myself doing anything else other than drawing. And I guess I was told that I was good at it. So I went ahead and did it. Um, and so far as I know, like people really love it. I mean, I like doing it, yeah. but I like doing it on my own terms. And that's the thing what I think is interesting about a lot of artists. Like, they need to go and do the whole thing about like learning how to do it on your own terms. That makes a lot of sense to me. That makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. I think especially um, you got a really unique style, right? It's not something that you say doing it on your own terms. I would humbly suggest you are definitely doing that. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's funny because it's like, I, I think what is kind of not great, what we teach artists is that, you have to be marketable. So to be marketable, you have to compromise like what your, um, why'd you pick such a hard career? I, I don't know if it's a hard career. I think any career in any context can be hard. You have to put a certain amount of work into it. It's just certain areas of work seem more noticeable to the naked eye or seem to flow into more what it is like a doctor's being hard work and a doctor like you're like, Oh, you, they make good money, but they have a lot of very high loans to pay. It's a very expensive sort of education. So you only start making it like maybe in your 40s or 30s or 40s. Like, I mean, there's not a lot of doctors that are in their 20s and they paid off everything like that. That's right. not a common thing. And I think that's the same thing with artists on some level, because artists, you know, they and also I think what doesn't help with art schools is they don't teach artists business. They kind of just teach them with the mindset of the cog in the machine. And I get if you're wanting to learn to be an animator or a writer or things like that, what kind of sucks is, is that, you know, because I went through college, I went to UC Santa Barbara for art, but it was a multimedia thing where there's some other areas like Art Center, and I'm not disparaging anybody that has been through Art Center, but you know, it's kind of a farm to make people work for, um, you know, animating, animation houses, art houses, things like that. It's kind of like fashion houses, like, you know, you have a bunch of artists or a bunch of designers that work for this one fashion house to continue on a certain type of style. And I've always had the theory because especially in animation houses, and again, this is not making it okay for people to rip off artists. I want to say that, but sometimes I think some of the styles that they teach or imbue into you. And also if you're doing animation, because I did study animation for a short period of time, it's easier to rip because the sim of the simple vectorization you can do, like you can oh. rip it that. So I sometimes wonder if that has something to do with it. So when interesting. You, yeah. I mean, that's what I've noticed. Cause like when you go look at, you know, illustrator and other things like you can do different things with artwork to reproduce it or to do that. Like for me, like if I have to vectorize demon bitch, I have to go through a certain way to do it. But that's what I've noticed is that it's a much more easier way for some of those styles to be reproduced. And also there's that question of AI art 
Uh, save that one, Christy, because uh, we're, yeah, we're no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> that's a whole can of worms. And yeah, um, I do want to hear your opinion on that, but I got a, I got a question about that. Yeah, yeah. So the, it, it, with AI art and such, so it's like with certain styles, I think it just I just chose to draw as myself of what I was influenced with. That sounds like a boilerplate thing, but I was not influenced by things that were kind of they were weird. Like mm -hmm. I had my friend, my mom would take me because we lived up in the Bay Area to Stanford and all that saying like, oh yeah, this is the school you're going to, right? Kind of thing. So we'd go to Stanford and the campuses were nice and everything. But then I would gravitate to the books for college kids and they were fucking underground comics. Yeah. So I picked those up and one of the first ones I picked up was Life in Hell. But oh, I remember, nice. yeah, I remember Jimbo. I remember kind of a few other things. I'm trying to remember there was this wrestler with a mask on that was like done in this really like heavy style, but it was, it was just like, I got into underground comics kind of like that. And then through my teens, I would actually get into anime, but I also got into things like the localization of dirty pair by Adam Warren and Torrance Smith, uh, apple seed, different things from Viz. Viz, Viz is yeah. still, I think a big purveyor of um, anime right now and manga. Uh, they've expressed, they branched, but then there's also other ones like um, I've gotten, in, there was the crow, you know, there were some splatter gore mm -hmm. comics I got into. This was in college. And I think like the main underground underground that I actually went into with was the opener of Love and Rockets. Essentially, Love and Rockets kind of opened the door. I've always like liked weird shit anyway. But then it's like I got more into The Crow at that time because the movie also came out around that same time. And then yeah. there was Dead World. If people oh, don't I, I love Dead World, man. That's yeah. not one of the big ones, but I was a fan. Oh yeah, like I I'd say it's kind of like proto Walking Dead, except the zombies are sentient and they're pieces of shit, you right. know, because they hunt down people and like so you had Evil Ed, which was the main zombie for quite a time. I think they killed him off at some point, but at that time, and then you had Lady Death, but you had Evil Ernie first of Chaos. So there was that. Hey, Mister Fish, what's up? Mister Fish, so, what's up, buddy? Yeah, so it's like there, there's that too. So um, you know, it's funny because I didn't, and then I had Cry for Dawn. Cryphodon was really good too. I love the artwork. I think that was the artwork and the storytelling was really good. And then it's just like I kind of did the corporate thing and just thought, oh, I just could do art for a while. Then I kind of got reignited into comics, and here we go. There we go on that. But um, you know, as I said, it's it's been interesting. I've always loved the medium. I've always loved what it is, and I never really absorbed any of the thing like, oh, if you're an artist, you have to be poor. Oh, if you're an artist or a comic artist, you have to be poor. You have to, I I don't believe in that. I think you can make a lot of money doing what you love. You just have to do it do smart. It right. So, so let's jump over to RW. I, I, RW, the same question for you. I mean, it sounds like you came to this through a little bit of a family connection, but out of all the things you could have chosen, why art? Uh, well, I mean, it was the only thing I was really good at, <laughs> you know. Okay. And um, you know, I just I started on it very early, and uh, I was lucky enough to get into like a like a magnet high school. It was a, a science and art technology, you know school and um uh, it was just uh the most easy natural thing like there really was no other choice and mm -hmm. uh, my first couple of jobs were like like retail and fast food kind of jobs like a lot of people but you know it just like you know i just never i couldn't fit there and uh but i was lucky enough to to you know to get a job and have a career as an artist like not in comic books but as a as a commercial designer and uh oh, you know nice. for the i worked for the att yellow pages for a long time and now I'm the lead 3D artist at a, at a company that makes uh, like emblems for you know, cars and boats. Oh, nice. Interesting. Interesting. And Mr. Fish, welcome, buddy. It's so great to see you. What's up, man? It's fun to be on this side of the show again. I was hoping you would jump on. In case you didn't hear, unfortunately, Lori can't be with us tonight. She had an emergency come up. Hope everything's going okay. Um, oh, but so. so if you don't mind, uh, Fish, we're just going to call you Lori all night. That's <laughs> fine. I mean... <laughs> I fell in for her when she's not on UHS, so I've pretty much just gotten used to being called not Lori. <laughs> well, you, you know, we're in one of these groups. I'm not sure if you guys are all in this one. I know RW is, but it's like they keep renaming it based on oh. whoever, <laughs> based on whoever called the, yeah. the latest drama. Uh, I yeah, every day's a new day. Oh, I never know who I'm talking to in there. Like for a week, we were all Chad because of something Chad Perkins did, and then, yeah, then Lori too. We, yeah, we were all Lori for a while, so. So, hey, uh, Fish, I want to ask you a question, buddy. So, uh, yeah. well, it's two because I want to get in the beginning. First off, how did you uh, decide to do art, and how did you get your start? Uh, 
a lot like Christy said there, I mean, there really wasn't a choice. I mean, I was an artist. That's just, I always have been. And I mean, and in the beginning, all that meant was I was the best artist in kindergarten, which means like I could draw the best dragster out of a triangle and two different size circles. Right. But I put little scribbles at the back for smoke. So that made me better than everybody else. (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, that little bit of praise was enough for me to hyper focus on it and not do anything else for the next 40 years. And, you know, that's it. It's just who I am. I mean, it's how I think things through. It's how I work through problems. I draw it out. And I've been making money as an artist since like junior high when I started drawing people's D&D characters and stuff. Absolutely. And I've done all kinds of different things over the years like i went to i went to a tech school for my art degree (laughs) and uh it was actually kind of unfortunate it was it was a great little school and they taught us a lot of great stuff exposed us to a lot of things like exposed me to 3d animation and design and animation and video production and all kinds of things i never would have done otherwise but being such a small school i was the best artist they'd ever seen come through. And everybody was so busy telling me how awesome I was that nobody was willing to say, Oh, by the way, you need to learn the fundamentals of how to make a good demo video, or it doesn't matter how talented you are. You're not going to get a job. And, you know, everybody's just like, Oh, you're so cool. Not, "Eh, you need to work on this. You do this. You need to finish that project, not start a new one. I wish somebody would have kicked me in the butt. I could have really used it. Uh, yeah, it, you make a good point in the sense that, you know, and I don't know, I don't want to speak for anybody. So, and viewers feel free to disagree with me if I've got it wrong. But, you know, it's sort of like a societal thing. Like they don't particularly support the arts. And what I mean by that is maybe you guys remember I was a musician for a number of years and that was a tough gig. And of course, I was a writer before I was a comic book maker. And that isn't exactly a free ride either. So I can only imagine how tough it must be to be, you know, a, yeah. uh, an emer- emerging younger artist. I mean, you've got most of the world telling you that this is too hard. You're never going to make it. You're not going to make any money, blah, blah, blah. Just trying to kick down your dreams before you ever get anywhere. And then you've got that yeah. weird other set of people that are so hyper excited for you that they're willing to hold on to any drawing you do on any napkin because they're going to get rich someday because they know you. And yeah. like, nobody's ever going to pay for that drawing of a dragon I did on notebook paper in junior high. But if you want to frame it, go ahead. I, I can I tell care. you once you become a big shot fish, I'm going to have my green zone number one slab and I'm going to sell it and put my kids through college. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that, because I'm probably the only artist I know working in comics that does not give a flip about working for the big guys. Like, oh, that is not my goal. I only really wanted, I've always wanted to be an indie comics artist. So yeah. I've made it as far as I'm concerned. I got where I wanted to go. Nice. And now I'm getting to tell my own stories. Forget about it, man. I'm living the dream, dude. This is... Good for you. I'll tell you what, let's frame a question like that because I'm very interested in this. I have, you know, I'm a little bit of an oddball myself. I have zero interest for working for the big two, and it's something I wouldn't even begin to consider. Christy, do you have any thoughts about working for the big two, or what is your what is your long-term plan? I mean, I think, like, being asked is fine. I mean, I just never really thought about going for it because it's actually, if I wanted to go for a major publisher, I was thinking of Fanagraphics. Because okay. Fanagraphics was something that, you know, they were more stories that I liked. Now, obviously, since then, you know, there's Valiant, there's IDW, there's all these other places that have opened up. Right. I mean, obviously, Image was a big changer, too, for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, for me, it's like I do little asshole comics. I mean, it's like, and also I do Sepulcher and stuff. But, you know, also I decided to do my own publishing company with one of my partners. And... Um, you know, he and, but that's not Horror Tour Studios. That's like a different studio. But it's just basically, okay, we're going to publish it. We're going to just put out something different and see how that goes and everything. And we'll go from there. But other than that, I'm not, um, you know, I think basically you have to make your own way. And you have to be open to making your own way any way possible. Now, if the big two asked me to do a cover, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shun it. But it's not like primarily what I want to do. And 
I mean, the thing is, is that if you can get into the big two immediately, great. Be known for drawing one of their characters and do that before you do your own. And when you do your own, go on your own to do your own or else they can legally take them. Some of them right, are like right. that. There's, there's been issues with that. Like even yes. Disney do that. If you try working or on your own stuff, don't do it on Disney time. Like there have been stories like that. And, you know, again, I'm not going to get into that. I don't know all the legalities. I just know about that. Sure. But the thing is, is that, you know, if you're running Kickstarters, publishers will notice because they're noticing that, oh, you have staying power, you have persistence, you have a certain level of quality and professionalism. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people feel bad if they don't get into the big two. And I'm not going to tell you, don't try to do it. I'm not going to tell you, don't try to do this or that, because everybody's life path is different. But if you are not in that, that doesn't mean you can never be there. You just have to kind of go a different way. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I had That's to... I failed at a lot of things before I got to where I'm at right now. You just have to persist in what the hell you're doing. You have, have to be willing to fall on your face if you're going to get anywhere. You got to be willing to fail over and over again if you have to. You got to be okay with sucking the first few times if you're ever going to get good at something. Like, well, and I'm fond of pointing out that failure, a lot of us view failure, oh my gosh, I failed at something, I went backwards. When the truth is, failure is one of these steps on the way toward success. So the no, kind of I'm not going to do it to next time. <laughs> yeah, right. That's how you learn it. So, so uh, let's move over to RW. So RW, in your case, um, the first thing is, do you have any designs to work for the big two, or what? What is your long term plan? Well, I mean, I don't really have any plans on on working for the big two because, I mean, I've already worked for one or two bigger publishers and, and found it to be a pretty negative experience overall. Can you well, share with us what you mean by a negative experience, if you want to? Uh, I got a couple thousand dollars in invoices out to a company from 2009 that they never paid. Oh, Ooh. you know, and yeah. that kind of yeah, that'll do it. You know, um, yeah, that's not good. But, uh, but honestly, you know, and uh, I walked away from comics for a long time because of that. I mean, I literally didn't do anything again until late last year when I started working on Natalia. And uh, but you know, but since that. You know, I got into the Facebook groups and I started meeting people and, you know, we found that I got invited into that chat that we were talking about earlier. And uh, the, the sense of community is so fun for me because where I live, like there's not really a peer group where I live. Like I don't, you know, I don't know anybody that does the same kind of stuff that I do. So I, I really enjoy being around all these people that make stuff. Hmm. You know, it's, it's a very supportive group and I like helping people out when I can. And uh, it's just great fun. Yeah, it's fun seeing you in the groups. Uh, do you mind if I ask where you're from? I live in Wichita, Kansas. Oh, nice. And so, yeah, we're kind of, you know, it's dead center, middle of nowhere out here. Wichita is not exactly the hotbed of uh, creative aspiration, I, I take it. No, I mean, we actually have a pretty great local art scene here, but it's kind of like, it's very isolated to here, you know. And like, finding people that are into the exact same thing you are is really hard. Like, I live in Arkansas, and finding anybody else that had any interest in writing comics or inking or coloring or any you can't find anybody anywhere. Like that's why I had to learn to do it all. Cause I could, I, I couldn't find anybody I could rely on to do it for me. And yeah. of course that was like pre-internet days. So nice. Nice. yeah, well, I mean, hooray for that. Or, you know, like, like I never would have met anybody. Nobody would have ever seen oh, my yeah. stuff, you know? So uh, let's jump over to fish a uh, quick question for you, buddy. So, so we talked about some of the challenges when you're starting out, what advice would you give to a newer creator or artist? that was just starting and then let's say they're even kind of struggling a little bit. What advice would you give them? The best advice I would give you is the best advice that I ever got. And it's two pieces. A is be the guy that people want to work with, you know, be the one that's, that's helpful. Be the guy that's there on time. Be the guy that hits deadlines, like be the kind of guy you want to work with and other people are going to want to work with you mm -hmm. and always do your best work. Like, I remember showing some of my work that I had done for a couple different clients to Eric Larson at a show once. And he very politely told me that I sucked and, <laughs> yeah. and I had all kinds of excuses like, you know, this and that, and there wasn't a timeline and this guy was a jerk. And, and he looked at me and he's like, the reader doesn't see any of that. And you're not going to be standing over their shoulder, making excuses. They see your work and your name, and that's it. That's the quality of work you do. So it always needs to be the best work you can get done in that amount of time. 
And, you know, the worst thing you can be is inconsistent because the readers don't know why potential clients don't know why new publishers don't know why you're inconsistent. They don't know this guy pays 20 bucks a page and this guy pays 200 bucks a page. Mm. They don't know this guy is a jerk or this guy made fun of your wife. They don't know that. All they see is the work in your name and it needs to be the best. You don't have to ever work with this client again. You could be too expensive or too busy or just say no. But you need to get through this job and do a good job because your name's going on it and that's your reputation and that's more precious than gold. You do those two things and things tend to work out for you in my opinion. Yeah, that's a good answer, buddy. Let's shift it over to Christy. I want to ask you the same question. Let's say you have a pal who's just getting started, maybe a young person who's kind of struggling at the beginning. What advice would you give them? Well, I mean, no matter how low you are on the totem pole, look at what you have to do to make it worth your time. It's a cost benefit situation. Now, you know, and also here's another thing too. If you have to take another job, that's okay because you're going to get to a place where you're going to do this 24 seven or whatever, and also learn how to take care of yourself and watch for yourself and have a very good self-esteem. Now, what I hate with artists is that they're saying, well, if you have a sense of good self-esteem, then you're an arrogant asshole. And I'm like going, that's not a sense of good self-esteem. Like you have to be communicative to people and people think that negotiation is like my way or the highway. It really isn't. Like all you're saying is like, look, I have this, this, and this needs, you need this. Is there something we could do to work things out? And that's all you really need to do. Um, I don't know why people are taught um, that, you know, you have to do these things like you have to kiss butt or whatever. Like nobody will respect you. I mean, people, if you charge abnormally low prices, people will look at that as an excuse to treat you like shit because you seem desperate. No, I mean, do you start off kind of low and then you work your way up? Yes, you have to. And the thing is, is that, yes, there's lots of advice. Not all of it's good. That's what I've learned. So what you have to learn is like, take the advice that seems to resonate the most, not the ones that you think that feeds your ego because everybody thinks that, but don't take the ones that just make you feel like shit. Like if you really don't feel you're going to get anything out of it, honestly, then don't. Don't take it. And I'm not trying to say, and this is, does not always include stuff you don't want to hear because there, there are times you will know, like you hear this and you're like, you know, I don't like this, but they're right. And you have mm -hmm. to go with that. And you will have to listen. Look, you have to know thyself. And people like tend to throw out these really blanket statements. And I'm not saying you guys here. I'm just saying in general, what I've noticed. Mm -hmm. And they don't really listen to each other. And that's what I have a problem. You need to listen. And you need to communicate. Oh, hey, what's up, Raw Dog? Sorry, my friend Lawrence is on there too. He does real deal comics. But you have to go and you have to you have to really um, listen to people. You have to digest things and you have to take a moment. And when I will also bring up the thing of self-care, it is not all of a sudden when you're overwhelmed, you kick people off the curb and you say, oh, hell no, blah, blah, blah. Because that's actually not self-care. That's you panicking and all this other stuff and being overwhelmed. We all get are guilty of that. Me too. But sometimes it's okay to take a moment and kind of digest about what happened and say, okay, so what do I, and ask yourself these questions and you will get them. Either you'll be guided to do it or inside you're going to, you're going to figure it out. And I think as you go along, you will trust yourself more on that. And you do have to understand that if you don't have a good feeling about a certain situation, you don't have to take it. There's going to be another situation that will present itself. And the thing is, is as it's like you should always have operate from a thing of self-esteem and a high regard for yourself. And again, that might make me sound like, oh, you're teaching artists to be arrogant. It's like, no, arrogant artists that I've noticed are blowharding everything else but making excuses of not to improve not to listen. They're not usually the best of listeners mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. usually assholes. And if you're a person that says, you know, oh, well, I am only going to pay you $5 a page. Well, no. Um, I know that if I'm starting out great, but I need to eat. This is not going to fulfill my needs. And this is way below even starting wage. So no, thank you. And I have noticed when you say no to people like that, you will have more room for people to pay for stuff. You don't have to be a jerk about it. Um, like, for example, 
when I was selling my sketches and at the time I was selling original sketches for 20 bucks, just random stuff like color studies, random sketches, things like that. And a guy came up to me, picked up one of the sketches and said, oh, I really like your sketches. I said, oh, thank you. And then he said, like, well, how much are these selling these for? I said, oh, they're twenty dollars a piece. And he said, oh, well, I was kind of hoping you'd sell it to me for lower. I said, well, what do you mean? How low? And they said, oh, five dollars. I said, I'm sorry. No. And he just put my things down and walked away. Now, anybody I've seen way too many artists say, well, OK, I'll talk. No, don't yeah. get talked down. You do this thing where it's like you work within somebody's budget. Yeah. That yeah. is very different than being talked down from your level of work. Would you go and sell your hundred dollar painting, for example, for twenty dollars? No, you spent what you felt worth a hundred dollars into that painting. Now, if they wanted twenty dollars, I said, "Well, I can give you a sketch. Well, I can do this. What are you willing to do for that amount of money?" And if you're not willing to sell it or do anything for that amount of money, then you don't have to take it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Something else will happen. And Thanks I've for that really thoughtful answer, Kristen. Yeah. I mean, I've been there where I haven't had the best economic situations. I've been there when I've been broke. It is very tempting to do that, but you have to hold out because mm. that's a certain level of regard of how they how you're to be treated, too. Good answer. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Let's move over to RW. RW, how about you? So you had a little bit of formal training as well and a little bit of family <clears throat> background you mentioned. If uh -huh. you had, uh, let's say it was you know, somebody in your family or like a general example, a young person just starting and they were struggling, what advice would you give them? Uh, well, I mean, I guess it, it really depends on what they're trying to do. I mean, are they trying to start out in comics? And if, if that's what they're doing, I'm going to steer them like right to the most helpful place that I found. And that's honestly the online community mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, Facebook groups and subreddits, because that's, you know, you can just like, you don't even have to talk. You can just listen and you're going to learn so much. Right. But, you know, uh, the question that I get asked the most is from other artists, and they're like, you know, like, and it's a frustrating question. It's, it's like, like, uh, can you teach me how to draw? <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, here, here's 40 sketchbooks, fill them all up, and when you're done, <laughs> you'll be better. Yeah, that's really the only way you can do it, is right, just get in there and, and get after it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as I said, it's like, you can't, it really depends on you. Like, and also there's a lot more cost effective situations. Like people go like, Oh, I have to be an art center. It helps the name. It helps with the networking, but really there's a lot of atelier art classes that will enable you to get your AA, even go to a community college, like for your, all your GEs, if you're really dead set, because what's great, I heard actually, they still do this because that was back in the day when they did it in college, but I'm glad they still do this. Take your community college courses and then you can go to any four year that you want. Yeah, and I think people really underestimate the value of that formal education because you learn things there in those studio environments that you just don't get anywhere else. And you get challenged by other artists and pushed into doing other things you haven't tried before. Yeah, uh, uh, formal critiques by your, you know, by your, your co-students that, uh, you know, they kind of teach you how to do that properly and how not to just be rude about it, but also how to accept criticism. And you know, people that haven't kind of been through that in a structured environment, they, they take every criticism like it's some kind of terrible insult. Or or they think it's like it's what you it's the gospel truth. Like there's two unhealthy mm -hmm. extremes that I found, too, because, yeah. yeah, in my career, like when I took everybody's criticism, then my work turned out to be shitty. And I'm not trying to say don't take criticism, guys. This is not a thing to say, oh, don't take criticism. You will learn the difference between criticism that is constructive. That's for you. And then there's just people that just say whatever, and it may not be for you. And that's one of the hardest lessons because I took every piece of criticism seriously because I was taught that in art school. And then my art was crappy because I followed everybody else and I really didn't listen to myself too. And again, I'm not telling you if somebody criticizes your work, you have to tell them to go fuck yourself, okay? Don't, you will know the difference between what works for you in terms of constructive criticism and what doesn't. Like. My mom like told me, oh, draw Hello Kitty because you'll make money. I, I obviously have no interest in really drawing Hello Kitty. So, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit off brand, uh, Christy. Well, I mean, yeah. And, and the thing is, is that I, I don't really like drawing lines like that, like all the time, like super precise. Because if you look at it, they have, I mean, when you look at any cartoon character like Mickey or Mickey or Hello Kitty or that, the very pop culture type cartoons, they literally have pro like proportion charts of where you have yeah. to and color keys so oh, you man. have to keep that yeah you have to keep that consistent so um you know again but it's not something you want to do you have to ask is this what 
is this along going to get me where I want to be? Is this what I really want to do? And I think those are perfectly fine to ask yourself. That's why I say definitely do some quiet time. Take some time to yourself and figure that out and reflect it and reflect on it. Um, and again, I just warn people, don't go to extremes. Don't issue every bit of criticism. But, you know, you don't want to go and say, oh, well, I take every piece of criticism and then why am I not succeeding? Because your art is you. You have to remember mm -hmm. it's you. And how you want to do it is that. It's like, yeah, I got criticized by a classic Archie artist. I wanted to go tell him to go fuck himself. Well, okay. How he told you, maybe that's kind of a little bit much. But if you don't want to draw Archie, you don't have to. Like, And is, is that advice going to get you where you want to go? Like, yeah. it, that might be great advice to get to work at Archie. But if that's not where you're headed and not what you want to do, it doesn't matter. My mom gave me all kinds of advice of the kind of stuff I should do. And my bad guy shouldn't be so mean and it shouldn't be so violent and it should be much nicer. Nobody wants to buy those books except well, I'm my glad mom. you brought that up, Fish. Hey, yeah. could you expand on this a little bit? I, I was just talking about this and I'll just quick say my point and then I want you to expand on this. There's a little bit of a tendency where bad guys are a little bit watered down these days. And uh, what I mean that by that, the language is cleaned up. There's certain kind of scenes that people are uncomfortable seeing. And mm -hmm. I personally prefer really vile and evil villains. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about your what you think about that? Oh, I, I, I want believable villains. That's what I want. Like, you could be a gentleman and still be a bad guy. You could be polite and be an absolute monster. Like, you know, but we need to see that. And, you know, I don't think we have to be like super nasty or vulgar or stuff. Like most of my stuff, I keep to where, you know, my whole family can read it. But that doesn't mean that I can't have terrible people doing terrible things and have vicious, bad, scary, bad guys. I might, I don't show a whole lot of times that people are holding their insides. But, you know, every once in a while, it's necessary to get the point across. Sure. But, um, like, I've got a story planned for one of the villains in Green Zone. I don't want to go in too much detail. But, like, it's going to be a background story that you start to see sprinkled throughout other stories. And you're going to see just what a monster this guy is. And, oh, I want to, I want to just tell everybody. But I'm so excited about this story. But like, it's going to be really disturbing when you see all those little pieces put together and realize what he does to this guy. And it's going to be horrific. <laughs> yeah. but, I'm going to look forward to know. that, Fish. I love your stories, and I'm uh, you got my attention already. <laughs> so let let's steer back to art. I'm sorry, guys. I sort of veered off. No, that's fine. Writing. It's a force of habit. Um, and I think I'm back to Fish here. So. A quick uh, show of hands or however we do it. Uh, do you guys sell art at conventions and is it prints or sketches? Well, Christy, how about you? I I do both. both. Um, what it is is that I'm kind of one of those people that kind of like I'll, I, I'll, I'll have some artwork that sticks out at me and then I'll print it and see how, if it catches on. Sometimes it takes it a moment, sometimes it doesn't. Or somebody will say, hey, I really like that one. Can you get a custom one made from, can you make, print me a custom print of that. And I think that's fine, you know, and then you could go and, and I found ways to kind of market it where it's like, I like cat print because they actually have really good prices and you can do an individual print. So let's say if I do a run of 10, but I want to do one of the same print, but with holofoil and all that stuff, they will do that one print for you. And the prices are pretty good. They're from New York. I've had to deal with them and their shipping is great. You know, I like them as well. Um, also, it's just sketches. So I do both. And gotcha. sometimes what I are hear... the things that are better sell? This, this is probably going to be different for all three. So I'll go around the room. What for you, Christy, is the best seller at your conventions? I would say prints like the 11 by 17. Because number one, nothing would piss me off is that I would buy a print and it would be so unevenly framed. Like this is what I mean. They're not standard frames. Like I had somebody, somebody bought me a print and it was 11 by 18. There is no fucking frame that's 11 by 18, but somehow they made a print by 11 by 18. I'm not trying to be a jerk because the art was really good, mm -hmm. but it meant that I would, to frame it, I would either have to cut it an inch right. or I would have to frame it with a mat custom and everything. Frame, and was, yeah. I mean, some people are willing to do it, but custom framing is really expensive. So I mm -hmm. looked 
like go to Michael's, look at like, or Hobby Lobby or wherever you live next to like a craft store, see what frames are most common. So there's 11 by 17, eight by 10, eight and a half by 11, those things. You look at the most common frames that you can see and make your frames to that. Cause I always tell people that's kind of like not a selling point, but it's a perk. I said, Oh, just in case, if you're wondering 11 by 17, also I bag and board my prints because you know, and then also oh, raise nice. the price of your prints a bit. I have found mm -hmm. that prints usually sell very well at 15 to 20, depending on the paper type. And that's really good as well. Um, I would say prints sell more than sketches. Although there were times when people bought two or three of my sketches. Nice. So, but then my sketches are more. RW, how about you? Are you a convention guy? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I've not been to one in a while, but we used to go quite often. And I can tell you, uh, like we always, I always sold, uh, I used to go with a, with another artist that I knew and uh, we would travel to Kansas City together. And we always sold uh, matted prints because some of the art that we did was, uh, you know, I was trying to do a lot of work in uh, like RPG gaming books. Mm. So most of the art is uh, you're painting stuff at like 20 by 30 inches. So you wind up with an odd size print. But then we would we'd make these prints and we would map them so that they would they fit to uh, you know like an eleven by fourteen or sixteen by twenty or whatever, and those always sold really well. And uh, you know we could sell sketches too, but you know what made the prints great was you could just kind of sell them over and over again. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And do you RW? Do you also do custom sketches live at the con? Yeah. Yeah. And do you yeah. how, do you like take requests for customers or do you have like a, a stable of how do you approach it? Oh, uh, you know, if somebody can provide reference to something I've never seen before, I, you know, I'm willing to do whatever. And, you know, we all have smartphones now, so that makes that a lot, <laughs> yeah. Right, a lot easier. Right, right. Yeah. Well, but, there's also. Oh, I'm sorry, RW. I apologize. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say that I really don't have a problem with people requesting whatever. I think what also I've found is kind of like the sleeper hit is uh, sketch covers for comics. Yeah. The I collect those, really by like the way. Those. Yeah, I'm, yeah. A, I'm a sketch collector a little bit. Mr. Fish, how about you, buddy? So do you sketch live at the cons? All day, every day, man. All day, I, every day. I clean up doing caricatures. I will usually make more money doing caricatures at a show than I make off of sales. No kidding. Even on my even best day. It. Yeah, I, I, and I got into it weirdly. Like it was when I was just doing freelance work all the time. I just happened across this guy that built a business around doing caricatures, but all he could really do was use a projector to trace somebody's head, but he couldn't draw bodies. So for years, half of my freelance work was just drawing caricature bodies, doing weird things with no heads. And then he would trace the heads on and sell it. Um, so I ended up started doing caricatures at, you know, craft fairs and shows and things around that I would be at doing them at church for the kids and stuff for fun. And turns out I make a lot of money doing that. And it's a pretty easy sell and it's a fun way to get somebody over to your booth. You know, like if mm. somebody's walking by and I'm like, Hey, you like comic books? And he's like, nah, I don't He walking by with his girlfriend. I'm like, you know what guys that buy caricatures for the girlfriends are 20% more likely to get lucky tonight. <laughs> Moving back <laughs> science, and now they're laughing and they turn around and his girlfriend's like, "Oh, you do caricatures?" I'm like, "Yes, I do." And a matter of fact, I could put both of you all in one for forty five bucks right now. And oh, can I ask you? I got two questions. And, what is uh, first of all the caricatures? How long does it take you to do one? And what's if you don't mind sharing? What's the price point? Sometimes it depends. I will I will move the price depending on what the show can afford. Like mm -hmm. you know, if people came to spend money, I will move the price up a little higher if it's a show where nobody came to spend money i'll make it a little bit more affordable but like christy said it still has to be worth my time i'm only going to go down so far and you know sometimes it's as low as like 20 bucks for you know black and white with a little touch of watercolor or something yeah so it's a deal man yeah and i can knock those out in you know 20 30 minutes usually it depends on how much talking and selling I'm doing. Like that right. 20 minute caricature could sometimes take an hour and a half if a bunch of people are at the table and I keep talking and making sales and whatnot and stopping to sign books. But, you know, if well, it's a line I stopper, can right? I got to guess long. when you're doing one, people probably stop and be like, look, what oh, this guy's they want to stop and see what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and the nice thing is, like, you know, nowadays, I don't have to have them sit there. I can be like, smile. 
take a picture. Uh, you go ahead and go yeah, shop. Yeah, yeah. I'll okay. text you when it's done. I got gotcha. They get to come back and be surprised at the end. Other yeah. people that come by, ooh, what are you drawing? And sure. you know, it starts a conversation, and mm -hmm. it's it's a good time. And, and, and since we're on this uh, subject too, and, and Fish, I want you to go first here. So we're talking about what you sell at conventions. What are your what are your best selling items at the conventions? Is it books? Is it sketches? Is it prints? Well, how do you? What's for your me, best item? Yeah, it's usually caricatures and then my books. But mm -hmm. like, I don't do like like I could flat get rich if I was going to do just a wall of prints and do Harley Quinn and Batman and stuff. Like, I mean, right. I could draw those really well, but I'm autistic and I have OCD and all these other things. And I don't care if nobody's going to arrest me for it. It's not legal, so I'm not going to do it. Ah, like good point. I just won't. It's not my property. I don't own it. I'm not going to do it. And I don't besmirch anybody else that makes a living doing it and is getting rich doing it. Mm -hmm. I wish I had the freedom in my mind to let me do that and get rich. But I can't. So I don't. Um, so it's books and occasionally some posters and uh and then sketching and that usually makes me a pretty good income on a show most of the time and uh christy let's move over to you how about you you have tons of things going on with conventions which by yeah. the way i'll bring up some of this information while we're talking what is your best selling item is it books is it posters what's what's your method you know the first three that i've gotten people to sell that they particularly love are my books because I draw them to the books, but a lot of times they'll be attracted to my enamel pins. Of mm, Demon I, I didn't even think about that. Sure. Pins. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. And then um, there's like other ones that I've done, which is the prints. So those three are kind of my top sellers, but you know, there's other merchandise. Like I have a demon bitch necklace. I have a demon bitch purse charm. I have a patch and I have stickers. So stickers are kind of like fourth. It's kind of funny bum behind. But I always have like a sticker. I have a bunch of stickers so people can throw me a three or three, three ones or a fiver on that. So that, you know, I mean, everybody has a budget and some of them are kids or some of them are people like, man, I don't have a huge budget. It's like, well, you can do a sticker. It's fine. Or I have small, like I think five by seven or four by six prints that are there that I assign. And I tell them the selling point is I sign it and I'll make jokes like I'll personally deface your stuff. And at first <laughs> they were like, but it's like, I'm not going to rip the cover off the book you just bought. But then I'll write yeah. sorts of really weird, rude things in there that people think it's funny. And so what you have up there is Asian Invasion. That's an event that I did. Um, it was actually on the tail end of COVID, but I live in California. So they remember when they closed down the cons on the West Coast right. again, because they had a resurgence, which was kind of crappy. So I just did Asian Invasion over at a comic store called The Comic Bug. And I think they've been Eisner nominated like a couple times, not Neiser up. Eisner nominated a few times. And um, the guy is Japanese. So I said, well, they're not going to give him shit. So I did Asian Invasion. And it was just a bunch of Asian comic book creators and artists and artisans. And we just, it became a thing, you yeah, know? I, I mean, I, I see it uh, blowing up the internet. I think it's a great concept, Christy. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I just got asked, you got to do the NorCal edition. I mean, I've had, like, you meet people from all over. And I became good friends with this guy named Philip Jin. And he just said, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to, like, they were begging me to do it. And I'm like, I just started with this one. I mean, what do you want me to do? But they want me to do it. So we're doing it for two days over in Oakland. On well, man, give a shout. If you ever come over to the East Coast, I would love to meet some of these people. I'm, I'm trying to make my, I'm trying to make my way over there. Um, they, I, I will say this about like the comics community. I know, I know fish is part of that. I know you're part of that, but like the way we promote anything that we're in is awesome. Like, even though if I may not see it just because I don't think it's because of them being lazy, it's just the whole, um, what is it? Um, uh, social media algorithms, but I know they're doing it. I don't, it's not a question of me yelling and screaming at them. Oh, did you do it? Nobody did it. They're actually really good at doing that. Asia, oh God. <laughs> That's a pretty good idea. I mean, it wouldn't be bad. I mean, I'm not averse to it. I'm like, oh my God, we're just going up to doing NorCal right now. And even I had people from the Latino comics um, area ask me to do it. And I said, well, I'd love to, but I mean, like literally I just started out and it's not that I don't want that. I mean, I've been excited to Latinx comic arts festival. Like they're wonderful people, you know, it's just, and I've 
participated in other ones, I just like said to them, you know, I just started this and I'm not saying that I don't ever want that, but wait till I grow a bit bigger and I can let more people in. So it's not like a no, it's just not yet. And, but I like it because people are like, oh, we should do this. We should do this. I'm like, and they said, well, you know, we can advertise. I said, I know, I just don't have the space right now. I have to wait until we grow enough until I can get the space and do it. But it is amazing how things are happening on that level. That's I really cool. Concerned. Congratulations with that, Christy. Thank you. Absolutely. Let's jump over to RW. He's the one that's got a live campaign right now. This is Cosmo yes. Natalia, number one of three, Journey to Planet X. We'll do a little call to action. Go over right now and check it out. This has got some terrific artwork. Um, RW, can you tell us a little bit about your campaign? Yeah, so uh, the book Cosmo Natalia is uh, it's about a Ukrainian-born astronaut who gets uh, launched on a clandestine space mission uh, like way back in the 60s. And uh, she has to, it's a, such a long trip, she spends most of it in cryo, and she's supposed to be woken up in 1994, but in 1991, the Soviet Union collapses, and uh, she winds up in cryo for much longer than that, and wakes up, you know, at the, at her destination, Planet X, about, at about 2024. And uh, when she wakes up, she encounters this American spacecraft, and she has no idea what's gone on, you know, back on Earth. And, you know, things have changed quite a bit. But, uh, you know, they also, they get planet side and, you know, there's all kinds of stuff down there. There's, you know, there's space dinosaurs and uh, sentient fungus in the water. And there's a warlord there named the Kravinian who's hell-bent on uh, taking the Earth that he views as always having been his to begin with. It sounds terrific, man. I love the angle of uh, Planet X. For those of you that didn't know, I used to be a retailer as well. I had a comic book store that was called Planet X. So that's a name that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I love the art style uh, that you have going here, RW. And so you're with Dean Page, right? Or how's he affiliated with this? So Dean Page and I kind of, uh, we cooked this up together based on a drawing that I did uh, about a year ago. And uh, he kind of helped me write it because I'm, I'm not a terrific writer all on my own. So, yeah, so Dean's role, he's the, the co-creator and writer. Okay. I followed his other book, The... Uh, the Return of Jake Sunrise, I think it was called. Yeah, and that's how I met Dean. As I, I helped him out with the, that campaign, also doing some of the promo art and his sculpture. Oh, form. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, he seems like a good dude, man. I, I wish you the best of luck with this campaign. Viewers, if you get a chance, go over and check it out. There's some terrific artwork there. That's Cosmo Natalia, Journey to Planet X. I love the title. Thanks. So let's jump back to Mr. <coughs> Fish. Uh, what do you got cooking, buddy? Uh, I am... I just finished up the Kickstarter for the Mighty Call, and I have just sent off the order for all the books. Now the Kickstarter finally released the funds, and my bank finally decided to give them to me once they got them. <laughs> I and hear you, man. It came over you. that holiday weekend, and I'm like, the whole time, I'm like, did I put the numbers in right? And so I got them. I just sent the order off to get shipped out. I'm waiting for the uh sketch covers to come to me so that I can draw them and then I'm going to ship them out. And then I'm starting to work on the next issue and I'm hoping to be able to push people over towards my Patreon as more of a subscription service because the next couple issues of call are going to get released there first. And hmm. then how many, how many I'm issues hoping, are we talking? I'm probably going to do like the next two straight to Patreon, maybe even the next issue of green zone. And then then offer it to Kickstarter because it just takes so much out of me to run a Kickstarter. I can't really do anything else during that time. I could have done two issues of call while I was running that Kickstarter. And mm. so if I could just make cool books and send them to the backers, I could get caught out every month. No problem. But yeah. having to stop everything for like six weeks and make a Kickstarter and pitch it and be on shows. Hey, I'm your fish. You know, that I hear you, brother. Me. I hear you. And you know, we get uh, some folks that watch this uh, broadcast to get creative tips and to learn from smart people like you guys in this room. And that's one of the things that people don't mention a lot is that, how do I want to say this? The craft of making and producing and fulfilling a Kickstarter is another set of skills entirely, and often it takes much longer than making the book does. Man. And, like, I mean, I just spent three days going over the lists and triple-checking everything to make sure that I was giving the printers, because I'm having the printers do the fulfillment for me this time around, 
that they had the right list of address with the right, you know, list of stuff on there. And I never really was an office guy. So spreadsheets are kind of foreign to me and it took a little bit of figuring out to get it all right. And I have OCD. So I got to check everything a whole bunch of times. Yeah. And that took like three days to get it. That it takes me, it took me three days or a little bit more for this cryptid book. I just finished it yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's there's a lot to it. Like, that's why I signed Green Zone with FSK to publish it for me because I know I'm not good at that. I know that part stresses me out, but with Kaw, I really wanted to push into that fear and not let it stop me from doing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't like anything that keeps me from doing something because I'm afraid I'm going to, I'm going to buck up and do it anyway, eventually. And so I did it and, you know, I'm making my way through it. It, it was nice. stressful, but I did. Congrats on that book, buddy. I, I mentioned a couple of weeks back, I think it looks terrific, and I, I'm a fan of your projects. I, I can't wait to check it out. And we'll, 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 swap, we'll swap reviews when these, uh, when these books come out, and we'll share them on the air. Absolutely. Man. Let's jump back to Christy. She mentioned something earlier that I wanted to talk about, and I wanted to make sure we uh, spent some time going over a subject that's kind of serious, and it does affect the art community, and I want to get the perspective of some artists who I respect, which I've got some of them in this room. And there's a lot of, make sure I say this correctly, there's a lot of noise being generated about mental health and how we need to protect ourselves. And it's a little bit called the comics broke me movement. And for the oh, people that maybe are not familiar with it, there's uh, some artists have been sort of overworking themselves and to the point of where it not only affects their health, but, um, you know, allegedly there's even a poor fellow that may have kind of worked himself to death. I'm not going to comment on that because I don't know all the details, but Christy mentioned how important mental health is and how important it is to take care of yourself. How and Christy, many you friends could, have we lost in comics? Well, I mean, that's, what, that's, what I, that's what I want to talk about. And, and Christy, if you could share with us, first of all, what's your thoughts on this movement? And second, um, any tips that you might share for people so they don't, how they can protect their mental health, if you would like to share that. Well, first of all, I would say as an artist, if you're a creative, learn business. It is very important to kind of learn how to do business, how to do contracts, and to know if you're going to deal with a corporate situation, business would a business and learning about business would help with that too. Even if you're not corporate, okay, but I mean, it's I'm just going to be very frank. Um, what I did not like in some ways and again this is not saying comics broke me that people don't have a legitimate issue because yes there is an issue of artists not being paid very well or or other creators being screwed over or whatnot i have had personal friends that have gotten screwed over by very terrible publishers doing very shady things i want to make that clear I, that you know that that's a horrible thing it should not be something that's the norm but what I will say is this, is that we had the old guard in that, and I'm not going to name companies or names or anything. I'm just going to say that the old guard where they did really crappy things to artists and other creatives, they did not pay them their due and artists had to go and actually, you know, Neil Adams was one of them, like had to go and start yelling and screaming, you know, image had to step up and do it. It's like, no, the thing is, is that I'm not saying that no one will advocate for you, but nobody knows how to advocate better for you than yourself. And I think people are taught not to do that on some level, or they're taught if they go at it alone, they're helpless or whatever. And I've been in this in, in that situation a lot, not necessarily that, but I've been in situations where I've had to stand up for myself because no one else would do that for me. And I actually came out really good because it's like, I spoke with my own authority about myself and people need to understand that. There's also another thing too, is, is that so you had the old guard doing their thing and screwing over people or whatnot, the whole corrupt system, quote unquote. Then you had the new generation coming in. No, we need more equity. We need this, this, and this. And then it turns out that a lot of those companies that are run by those people are doing the same thing, if not worse. So that's the big hypocrisy nobody is talking about. And the thing is, is that, that it's not just one thing. It's not just, oh, it's just the evil publishers. It's like, okay, it's kind of like Animal Farm. You know, you have an old system company you know coming up you know you get rid of the old system like animal farm the alcoholic farmer then the pigs take over there's this inner war about everybody and then the pigs end up if not worse than the actual original people 
So mm -hmm. I see that a lot in comics and I'm not trying to name names or anything. And then there's some people that say I work so hard, but then they're all Twitter on day all day harassing people. It's like, no, you kind of don't, you know, some of you don't. And I'm not trying to say, oh, it's just one thing or another. I think the mistake is, is that we're thinking it's just one thing and it's not. There's a multifaceted thing. And if you really want to go and actually change it, the thing is, is that A, learn business, B, know your own worth, C, like work with your own authority. You actually can do things with your own authority. And it's like, oh, I mean, there you will be surprised. Like when I did, like recently somebody swiped some artwork. It was actually fan art that I did. Of I Earth. saw that. Yeah, I put it up on there. But yeah. yeah, and I did every fucking facet. And again, I wasn't even planning to do it. I just did it to be fun, you know, like whatever. But I mean, they had Disney. So I just said, okay, you know, this is what I'm, this is what I'm doing. So I sent every agency that I knew of after these people and I took suggestions, but what I did not listen to is people saying, well, you know, they're going to go and do it again. Like, no, no, they're fucking with me. No, they, I, they will not deal with this from me and I will not deal with this from them. And you have to have that mindset. And sometimes that's the only thing keeping you from fucking you over. I mean, when you look at Neil, I mean, do it smart, but look at Neil Adams. He did that. It's like, no, you do not treat me like shit. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of the other, like the image guys, what did they do? They went and did image after they did mm -hmm. whatever, because they wanted to be known and paid for what they wanted to be done. Yeah. They wanted to do their own stuff, then go off and do it. You know, nobody's yeah. stopping you. And it's like, but you know, like if anybody offered any cri constructive criticism, I've noticed they got labeled as one thing or another. And it's like, look, this is not bad advice because mm -hmm. I've actually taken this advice myself and it's actually worked. I've had that personal experience where I had to learn my own authority for myself. It's also called self-empowerment guys, but like you speak, nobody's going to protect you as well as yourself because yeah. you know what you want and what you need. I'm not saying that you won't ever have help. You won't. I'm not saying that. It's just that I'm saying that no one need, knows your needs better than you. And you sometimes need to go and express that. And I think with the whole comics broke me, I'm kind of going, okay, guys, so here's a problem. Are we really going to solve it? Are we really willing to take a look at ourselves and solve it? What are we going to do individually? Because it's great to mobilize and all that, but groups, no matter how great they are, they can't fulfill everybody's needs. Yeah. They try. You know, I, I run a group, Comic Art Professional Society. I try to go and fulfill my members' needs. I try to work in the best interest. Sometimes I don't make everybody happy. So tell you what, save that one. We'll, we'll, I'll come around in the circle. I'll ask about yeah. comics art professionals. Yeah, so, yeah. RW, how about you? Do you have any, uh, and, and thanks for that thoughtful answer. Yeah. No, RW, it's a How about you? Do you have a uh, any tips or anything for artists to avoid burnout and how they could pre protect their mental health, I think is probably the best way that I want to ask. Well, I think a lot of us have uh, this, this kind of voice in the back of your head that tells you that if you're not working 22 hours a day, you're not doing enough. That's and really. Good. You need to take a minute and have a nap once in a while. You know, go see your friends and family. Take a day off, and it, that's really hard because you you feel bad, you feel guilty that you're not at your desk or at your computer working all the time. And it's a that's, that's you know some people you know would do, would say, well, that's just your drive, you know, and, and it's great to have that, but you can't do it all the time. And uh, you know, I, I still work a full time job while I was doing Natalia, and I, I just kind of got into it. And I was at my desk every day for like 30 days in a row or something. And at some point, I lost like 10 pounds. Hmm. And, you know, yeah, people started telling me, like, you look thin, man. Are you OK? And and I really had to I had to take some time off and eat some cheeseburgers, you know, <laughs> but it's but I did it to myself, you know, yeah. and there's lots of abuse to be had from other people. You don't need to be doing it to yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good answer. That's and a good and answer. I will I will add another thing, too, on top of RW's remark. I know I've had my time, but I do want to add to this. The thing is, is that the more that you abuse yourself, the more you can't take abuse from other people or stand up for it. It's, again, mm -hmm. you need to take care of yourself. So if people decide to be assholes to you, because no matter how good you are or how nice of a person you are, you will just have some people that are jerks. And yeah. you will have to stand up for yourself in whatever way you need to. Some people yeah. are that way, right? Mr. Yeah, well, you don't want to you don't want to mix up paying your dues for just be, getting beat up all the time. Yeah, yeah. 
Mr. Fish, you and I have talked about this before, the importance of mental health in the creative community. And I'd love to hear your two cents here. Um, people are struggling with this, right? What are Mr. Fish's tips for protecting mental health? My tips are do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Those <laughs> knew, are my tips. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> oh, you know, you've got to... You've got to protect your mental health, and we should be putting as much effort into taking care of ourselves physically and mentally as we are into honing our craft and into doing our jobs. Because, like, if nothing else, like, I need to be out there walking and exercising just to make the whole con experience easier so that I can do this without being winded, you know, feeling like I'm going to pass out trying to walk across a giant convention center. Um we should be taking care of our mental health so that we can do this work for a longer part of our lifetime and not die early from a heart attack, you know, because we worked ourselves to death. And I'm the worst about it because like, because this is my full-time job and I work from home, I'm always at work. So I might as well be working because I'm here. And I'm, you know, also living with a neurological disability, which a lot of people don't realize. And, you know, by the time I've been working for 12 hours all day and I'm tired and I'm shaky and I can't make it to the kitchen to get, you know, a plate of food and come sit down without dropping it and not being able to see anymore. So my wife brings me my plate and I eat and I'm too shaky to walk across the house and do laundry. I'm too shaky to go put the new mailbox up that she's been asking me to do. I can't really physically get up and do a lot. So I might as well sit here in my chair and keep doing some more work because at least I can get a little further ahead on the next mortgage payment while I'm sitting here. And so a lot of times I work straight through until bed, get up and work straight through till bed. I, I'm constantly, you know, mentioning, you know, like we can't let ourselves be treated like manga artists and be worked to death. And then I recently was shown a schedule of one of these manga artists has to work and I remember thinking as they were talking about his schedule, it's like, God, what would I do with three whole hours to myself a week just to do what I wanted? And I, and then it hit me after fantasizing about what I do with that three hours. I was like, that's not good. I need to change something. I think, and, yeah. I mean, I think the thing is, is that I think also figuring out your own energy workflow seems to help with me too. I don't know if that works for everybody because and again, I apologize if I'm jumping in, but it's like we're taught, oh, if we're stuck at our desk for 24, like with artists, you got to draw all the time every day and everything. And then I started getting numbness in my arm and everything. And then I'm like, this is probably not good. And at one point I did get tendonitis, not from drawing, but from an office job. But then I realized that if I were to get it, and I think after that episode, it was like, it wasn't severe where I got permanently damaged, but now it's like, ooh, if something is like not comfortable my body's like oh hell no but the thing is is that what you learn is that i understand my work schedule sometimes i'm super prolific in art and i'll go with it but then if i'm not then i can just use this time to rest mm -hmm. and regroup i just have a quick comment that i'll share and this pertains to the other writers out there which is stop pitching the deal to artists that they will get paid after the kickstarter funds i don't yes. know why anybody takes that deal there's many and by the way, I realize there's all kinds of different ways to make a book. This is one man's opinion. I don't think it's fair to the artist to make that proposal. The reason why there's many things that can affect a Kickstarter funding that are beyond the creator's control. So what you effectively get is the artist has done typically all the work and maybe not gotten paid at all. So uh, artists, that's my tip from Tim. I wouldn't take that deal if it was made to me. Look, everybody in my group gets paid up front. Yeah, I mean, good, man. one one guy, he was a writer and he talked to me about Kickstarter because I think he had only done one before and I'd done five, four were successful. The first one failed. And he asked me, well, like, OK, I just got a job. So should I just go and just do the thing with the funding of this? this is and I said, you know, just make it simple. Just look at it at this timeline. Work at your job, make enough money to pay the artist for all the pages that they need to do that way. Cause I've seen it. I told them I've seen it happen where it start, stop, start, stop, stop, start, start, stop, start, stop, you know? And it's like, if you want consistent flow, 
just get enough money, budget enough money to pay for an artist and for all the work for that particular book so it doesn't get held up and then do your Kickstarter because you always want to have your book done before the Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah, that was 99.9%. Yeah, that, that's a great tip. That's a great tip. Yeah. And, you know, look, I, I say this as if, and again, don't hear that I know what I'm doing. I don't, right? I'm flying by the seat of my pants. But I've done six of them now. And one of the things I've learned is that I have too much anxiety to say, hey, go ahead and fund my Kickstarter and then I'll finish my book. Like, I, I just can't do it. So, what I you get for me is our books are what they call sort of in the can, meaning they're illustrated, colored, and I always do at least 50% lettering before I launch the Kickstarter. Because lettering is something, you know, you can sort of, you can sort of make do with the lettering to get around that stuff. But again, right. that's, that's one man's opinion. You guys do it. Uh, either you like, uh, do either of you guys uh, use like an escrow account to get paid? No. Nobody's ever done that. Well, so a, tell us, a, tell us a little bit more what you mean, RW. Uh, well, cause like you don't really want to, you don't really want to pay your artists if you never work with them like in full up front. And then, and then, you know, like they might not have any impetus to actually do the work after that, but you can, you can actually put money into an escrow account where it's secure from both of you, mm -hmm. you know, until mm -hmm. the work is complete. Sure. And like, you know that you're going to get paid. Like a contractor. You're going to get the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, I personally, I like to work on a milestone basis. Mm. Because I, I feel like it's more fair for me and the person I work with, especially if we don't know each other. Mm -hmm. There's a lot less risk for everybody involved. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. I'm, Actually, I love that I'm one of the weird ones that I've been lucky enough to find a group of great clients that are all like, it's a prepaid basis with me. But I also offer a big discount for people that prepay in full. You know, it can be oh. 50 bucks a page off if you prepay for a book in full. Wow. Which to me essentially is like, what I would be paying a manager or something to be out there hustling for me every day anyway. And this way I can end up with a whole lot of prepaid work ready to go scheduled. And I'm not worried about like, if I'm doing pages for Tim and he's caught up at work and can't check them today and can't give me an approval to go forward and I'm stuck, there's another job I can start working on. I always have prepaid jobs. I don't have to just, go out there hustling like hey christy you need any work today uh, rw hey is there anything i could do for you and i spend my whole day hustling for work and not get anything i've hmm. always got work to do and it works out great for me they get a good discount and they know i'm going to produce i'm going to get the books done like i'm a known commodity for these guys and they've got plenty of books to do the hardest part has been telling them no on projects that they want to get done because i want to start doing more of my own books and it's very easy to take your money today to pay my bills than to work for myself today or have to save up money to pay myself today to work on a book that's not going to pay off for two or three months. Like, mm. that's scary. Taking your money today is really easy. And it kept me doing other people's books for a long time. But well, I, I think one of the main takeaways here, and you guys, of course, tell me if I got this wrong, at least it's true in this room, is the artist that I've chosen to represent this panel you guys are all pretty savvy in the business world and have made some pretty smart uh, decisions. At least it seems that way to me. I, I want to believe <laughs> that's true. But I don't know that it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, I and do. as you know, there's been some horror stories and I'm somewhat relieved to hear that. Oh, man. Well, it may be relieved isn't the right word, but I, I'm really happy that you guys uh, have shared these thoughtful answers. And really I'm, I'm grateful for this information to be shared to the groups out there and in particular um and again it probably seems like i'm focusing on this but it's very important to me and i sense it's important to you guys mental health is a thing guys so please take a moment and protect yourself protect your mental health protect yourself from unsavory business practices and look out for each other so we're almost to our time i can't believe that we're actually have gone this far you guys are really interesting but why don't we do this we'll go around the room and just tell us again who you are what you're known for where we can find you and why you are awesome. Christy, let's start with you. Well, uh, my name is Christy Shin. I'm the creator of Demon Bitch and Sepulchre. I'm also the president of the Comic Art Professional Society, um, where we go and we organize with a now international network of artists and we try to help them out. We will be at San Diego Comic Con. I do a lot of underground artwork and I have a background in multimedia art as well as fine art. 
and I kind of draw what I like and I kind of don't give a shit. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I mean, I like, I like to do what I like to do because if I don't like what I don't like to do, then it shows. Mm -hmm. So I always try to go and do the best that I can in what I do that way. Christy, I'm a fan and I just want to say thanks so much for coming on and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. This is a blast. Let's jump over to Cosmo Natalia. R.W. Nunley, tell us who you are, what you're making, and where we can find you. Uh, yeah, so my name's R.W. Nunley, or you know, most people call me Randy. And uh, you know, I'm the artist behind Cosmo Natalia, which is probably you know the only really thing that I have out right now. Uh, it's you know like my first comic back from a long hiatus from doing any kind of artwork. And uh, you can find that on Kickstarter. It's live now. Um, you know, the rest of my work, you can find it on, you know, like Randy underscore Nunley at Instagram or just on my Facebook page. And you can you know, hop on there and DM me anytime. I love talking to people. Nice, nice. And uh, viewers, again, call to action. That's Cosmo Natalia, Journey to Planet X. I think this thing looks terrific. Also, my pal Dean mm -hmm. Hayden's involved with it. I wish you every success on this project, R. David. I think it looks terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, man, I saved the classic fella for last. Mr. Fish, uh, now, I don't have a link ready for you unless you want to shoot one. But oh, most of us know you. Fine. Tell us who you are and why you're awesome. I'm Mr. Fish from Mr. Fish Comics. I'm the fastest working man in indie comics. I have worked on, I am just about to wrap up my 66th book in the last five years. I normally point to the wall behind me, but I just switched my office and they're not there yet. <laughs> I've helped my clients raise almost, just right at almost 100 grand so far. And I'm also the writer and creator of Green Zone Life in the Blocks and the brand new The Mighty Call, The Crow Magnet. And you can find me at Mr. Fish Comics on all the social medias and the onlines. And I'm on Patreon now, too, which you can sign up for as little as like 15 bucks, get the physical book sent to you. You can even sign up if you want to get a regular commission from me. There's a couple of slots for getting a regular monthly commission. If you've been one of those guys that want to get a cover or a pinup or want to get one page a month out of me, that's a good way to do it. <laughs> cool, man. And uh, Fish, thanks for jumping on, man. Absolutely, man. Anytime. I, I love your show. Yeah, I love I the fact it. that we get to talk about real things and learn things because there's so much good information on the show every time. Well, and, you know, thanks for saying that is I'm fond of pointing out I'm not that smart a fella. So I like to learn things from people like you, and it's how I – figure it out and my goal is that maybe people that are watching it they can pick up these tips that'll be helpful to them so in closing i just want to say thanks again to my terrific guests christy shin rw nunley and of course mr fish comics man this is a great episode thank you so much for your thoughtful answers it means a great deal to the viewers this is the creative cranium we'll look forward to seeing you guys next week good night everybody bye <laughs>